Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. Happy Friday. We're pleased to have with us today Colonel Steve Warren from Operation Inherent Resolve coming to us live from Baghdad. Steve, good morning, and you're missing all the snow here. We wanted to turn it over to you, and happy to see you. Yeah, good morning, Jeff, and good morning to the two or three members of the press corps who made it in today. It's good to see that some of you at least were able to dig out of the snow. Uh, here in Iraq, we enjoyed uh, we enjoyed the social media show. Uh, I, I particularly liked all the pictures of uh, you know y yard furniture covered in white stuff and and rulers sticking out of the snow. Uh, so if you if you if you tweeted one of those pictures, you were the only one. Trust me. I do want to uh, cover a couple of things quickly. Uh, over the last week, we've kept pressure on ISIL across the depth and breadth of the battlefield. Uh, wh what I've got for you today is a, uh, a map that shows airstrike intensity. So uh, please pull up map number one, titled Coalition Airstrikes. This map shows the location and intensity of airstrikes in Iraq and Syria uh, over a one-month period, the last month, from July 1st through July 28th. As you can see, the concentrations were really in three broad areas, Mosul, uh, the Ambar Corridor, specifically Ramadi, uh, and the Araka area. Of note, uh, we are also uh, striking the lines of communication uh, in and around these areas. 87% of these airstrikes are dynamic, the remainder are uh, uh, pre-planned. So with that, we'll go to the, uh, the uh, opener map, the Sejoa map. On the ground this week, in Iraq, operations have focused on clearing in Ramadi, improving defensive positions in Sinjar, and patrolling in Beji. We've seen small dust-ups in both the Euphrates and Tigris River valleys, but no significant tactical actions. Uh, please bring up the Ramadi map next. You'll notice that the uh, Ramadi city center has now been cleared of enemy forces. The ISF are moving into the eastern suburbs. Uh, this past week, the Ambar police took over as the hold force uh, in many areas, which allows the CTS uh, to rest and refit for future operations. Please go back to the uh, opener map. Uh, in Syria, we've seen much the same, fighting along the Mara Line continues to be contested as both forces conduct limited offensive operations. That's at star number four, which is not on your map. Uh, it's in the upper left-hand corner of your map. Um, while forces uh, holding the Tishreen Dam improve their defensive positions. Uh, this map also depicts, we've tried to combine two things here, this map also depicts the territory that ISIL has lost uh, and gained since uh, August of 14. So what you can see there in green, in the green shade, is area that ISIL once held but now no longer controls. In the kind of brown, tan brown, is what uh, this enemy still holds. The, the grayish area there is area is controlled by somebody other than ISIL. And then, of course, the white is just kind of sparsely populated desert. So this reflects our estimate that ISIL has lost approximately 40% of the territory it once held in Iraq, approximately 5% of the territory it once held in Syria. That's it for my operational update. I, I, I want to do a quick training update as well and tell you that the 72nd Iraqi Army Brigade is finishing up training in Besmaya. Uh, that training is led by the Spanish and the Portuguese contingents. This training was extended by about six weeks in order to include a new focus on obstacle breaching. I do have a short video uh, to show that just kind of gives you an overview of what some of this training looks like in action. Uh, so with that, uh, Divids, can you roll that one video, please?
What I wanted to give you... What I wanted to give you with that... What I wanted to give you with that video is a taste of what the, what the training is that we're conducting up in Best Maya. You saw several things there. And initially, that explosion, that was a Miklik, a line charge used to breach obstacles. You later saw um, an Iraqi soldier firing a, um, an AT-4, an anti-tank, uh, shoulder-fired uh, rocket or missile, which has been used to great effect against our enemy uh, uh, truck bombs. And then you saw uh, the Iraqis conducting some room clearing operations. So that's it for my opening uh, remarks. And uh, without any further discussion, uh, we'll turn it over to questions. If AP is there, I guess we'll start with you. Hi, Steve. It's Lita. Um, can you expand a little bit on your training um, information about how many Iraqi soldiers have gone through this advanced training? And as you look ahead to operations moving towards heat in Mosul, is there a number that uh, the coalition is looking to have trained before you actually have to start um, the major operations up there? We've trained, uh, right now we've trained about 20,000 total uh, Iraqi security forces. Uh, that does include police, and uh, it also includes the uh, tribal fighters, the, the uh, Sunni tribal fighters. Uh, so, pr pretty good number. What we're doing now is in the process of, of building the force that will go to Mosul eventually. Uh, we don't have, we're not really prepared to put out a, a, a number right now. Uh, we would think it'll be roughly 10 brigades, um, you know, with anywhere from, you know, about 2,000, sometimes 3,000. It depends on the brigade, how many people are in the brigade. Uh, so we think roughly ballpark of 10 brigades that need to be built. Uh, and these all have to be trained. Some of, the, some of the brigades that will go to Mosul, we have already trained, but we want to touch them again. We want to give them some, some additional training uh, that they can use to build on what they learned first through our training and second through their experiences in, in Ramadi. Uh, so uh, that's kind of where we are right now. The ones that you say are um, have been trained are any, and I guess maybe this um, this uh, uh, 70 77 second um, are any fully trained and prepared for Mosul, or are there none at this point? None of those brigades at this point would the coalition believe are fully trained um, for those advanced operations. Well, we believe that all of the forces that we've already trained and run through uh, uh, Mo or, uh, Ramadi, for example, are certainly capable of, of moving to Mosul. But we have made a decision that we want to run them through another cycle of training. So are they trained? Yes. Could they go to Mosul now? Yes. Uh, but we would prefer to give them additional training before they go. And I think the, uh, you know, and this is our recommendation to the Iraqis. Of course, the Iraqis agree with us. So we're building the plan now uh, as to how rapidly we can move uh, these brigades through the, through the training pipeline. Thank you. Uh, Jim from yesterday. Uh, hey, Colonel Warren, uh, just a little follow on, on, on that. Um, uh, of the 10 brigades that uh, you need, and you know, some of them will go through uh, training again, others will get training from the start. Um, could you give some sense of the extent of those individual trainings? In other words, the brigades that haven't gone through yet, uh, are they going to need several months of training or, or, or what, sort of, what sort of timeline are we looking at? Well, the training, uh, our, our, our standard training is eight weeks uh, of training. Uh, additionally, we've got things like commando school, sniper school, uh, some medic training, things like that. But the av the standard block is is ten weeks. Uh, <clears throat> that may expand based on uh, you know a specific unit that perhaps is earmarked to do a specific thing. May need some additional specific training. For example, if there's uh, the unit that's going to be the first one to go across uh, a bridge, let's just say, uh, we'd want that unit to get some training on how to do that. Uh, so again, it's always going to vary, but the baseline is eight weeks. Follow on Ramadi, you mentioned that the Anbar, uh, Anbar police are starting uh, to 
uh, provide uh, security, which is allowing the conventional forces and the uh, counterterrorism forces to leave. Do you have a, a general sense of what percentage uh, of the city the police is securing now? Well, um, I hadn't looked at it that way, percentages. I can tell you that uh, I think it's six of the uh, CTS battalions have already withdrawn from Ramadi and been replaced by, by police. There's, a, there's three CTS battalions remaining uh, uh, in Ramadi. Uh, so I don't have a percentage for you, Jim. I just haven't looked at it that way. Um, but we are seeing the turnover begin to happen, specifically from the CTS. The Army, the conventional Army, they still uh, haven't turned anything over yet uh, to, to the police, but the CTS, uh, the counter-terror service has. So really, it's, it's majority Army at this point, uh, with some neighborhoods, a handful of neighborhoods in control uh, by the police, but the, is, is the conventional Army. Brian. Uh, yes, within the um, past few weeks, B1s left CENTCOM for the first time since 2001, and these were a huge part of the coalition air assets available. In fact, I think the last six-month rotation of B1s set a record for most bombs dropped during a rotation. Is, does this represent a loss in capability for the coalition, and are you aware of any plans to replace this capability of assets for the coalition? Yeah, we, we so we have the we have the airframes we need uh, to conduct uh, the operations that we want to conduct. As you know, uh, two carrier strike groups have moved in uh, over the last I don't know month or so. Um, additionally, uh, there w there's other uh, airframes that are scheduled to come in. Uh, we're not prepared to really announce exactly who and what that's going to be yet, uh, but we're confident that we we're not going to lose any capability. Hey, Steve, it's Marcus. Uh, how, those additional 10 brigades, have you looked at how many additional U.S. or coalition trainers are going to be needed to train them, and have you made any recommendations back here to Washington? So that's, we have, the short answer to your question is no, we have not yet. Uh, we're in that process now of determining, and it's not so much about whether or not we can do it, it's how rapidly you can get them through, right? Uh, you know, we can train all 10 with what we have, uh, so then it becomes a question of, you know, do you make the pipe a little bit bigger so that you can put more through the pipe faster. Uh, so that's what we're working on now, and that's working on several levels, obviously. Uh, you know, at the, at the higher level, it's a matter of, uh, of, of working with other partner nations to see what else they're able to contribute. For example, there's an additional 15 uh, uh, Italian Carabinieri trainers due in here in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, 15 may seem like a small number, uh, but they're, they're going to build to train police. And that's enough for them to be able to m rapidly, you know, increase the throughput of police that are getting trained. So we're doing the analysis to, for, to determine how rapidly we believe we can train uh, with what we have on the ground, and then uh, what enablers and what additional trainers uh, could, could be requested, always through the government of Iraq, and how, how much that would allow us to increase our throughput. Uh, Steve, um, can you tell me if uh, General McFarland is having uh, any, uh, s playing any role in um, the operations in Libya? I, I know he was the first guy to be, um, to oversee both Iraq and Syria, and it sound, it's increasingly sounding like some operations in Libya are getting pretty similar against the same enemy, um, but that's AFRICOM. I'm just wondering how that's playing out for General McFarland. Uh, as of now, it's not playing out at all. He's he is his focus is on uh, Iraq and Syria. Bill Hunnigan. Hey, Steve. Uh, so I was wondering uh, what the expectations are out of this coming um, coalition meeting. I mean, uh, are you going to go there go there with some explicit asks of these coalition partners and how they can step their game up, uh, particularly with the B ones going out of. Um, the AOR, I mean, do you want more coalition aircraft, trainers, can you, anything? Uh, 
Well, I think that, I mean, you're, you're talking about the, the meeting the Secretary of Defense is, will, will be attending here in the near future. That's really for, for them to talk about. Um, we right now at this point have not yet uh, finished working through exactly what the training set needs to look like. Uh, so that's an ongoing process. So I think, uh, well, I can't speak. I don't know what the, what the Secretary will be asking when he gets there. I just don't know. Well, I would imagine that his, uh, his visit there is going to go off your recommendations, or at least what General McFarlane wants to see there. I mean, are, are there areas in which you, you're, you feel as though that the coalition is uh, wanting? Yeah. Again, so we just the, the answer to that question doesn't exist yet, right? We're still conducting that analysis. I mean, we, we we've seen some things, right? We've already talked. You know, the, the prime minister uh, of Iraq has come to us and said, "Hey, he would like to see more police get trained." So that's one thing that we know. Okay, we need more police training capability. Uh, but the rest of it is still. I mean, we're still deliberating. We're still analyzing. We're still going through that process of trying to determine exactly what we need. Steve, someone actually covered my question already, but um, I do have a question on the map. I don't know if you know which map is up now, but it's, I think it was the first one you showed us. Uh, there's just little dots of this dark red that, nope, no, the other one. That one. I don't, you probably can't see what we're seeing anyway. Is it the one that shows where ISIL has yeah, gained and lost? Yeah, exactly. The one where, they, where ISIS is, what they've won and what they've lost. And you mentioned that it was from August of 2014. Yeah, that's the one. What are the, the dark red that's, it says it's ISIL territorial gain. So that's territory they've gained since August of 2014. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, it is. So, uh, and, and it's all territory that you're familiar with, right? I mean, Tadmer, um, Palmera, a little, little piece of land up in the upper left-hand corner there, vicinity of... Uh, the moral line. Um, that's about it. What was the timeline on that? And then just one other question um, on the training. What what is the number right now that are going through the the pipeline? Like how many roughly on a week in a week are fully trained ISF turning out? Whether it's the basic eight weeks or whether it's more advanced. What's the rough number? It, it really it varies wildly, frankly. Um, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I, I got to get that number for you. We, we do have some of those numbers, but I'll tell you, they, they, they just happen to vary significantly just based on what's going on. Um, over the last, I can tell you, over the last uh, month or so, we've gotten about 900 police officers and, and roughly two brigades uh, through training. So, but this was the, this was the most uh, training that we've had most graduates that we've had in, in, in a month. But, you know, there's been weeks or months when it was significantly less. That has to do with everything from uh, the operational temple on the battlefield to what else is happening in Iraq if there's a pilgrimage or something going on that the forces are needed to, to, to uh, provide security for. Uh, so there really isn't a, uh, a clean line on that right now. But we, we've been very satisfied recently of, of this steady, you know, when, when we first started a year and change ago, it was definitely in fits and starts, right? We had a hard time getting enough troops, uh, enough Iraqi troops to the training, and, and you know there was much, uh, much discussion about throughput. Throughput's not an issue for us now. We we are operating, maybe not at 100 percent capacity, but we are operating, uh, uh, you know, at at full capacity. Uh, so yeah, we're satisfied with with the throughput. Thank you. Uh, David Martin. Um, are you going to have finished your work on how many trainers are, are needed and uh, in time for Carter's meeting with uh, defense ministers? And uh, second, is the concept that uh, operations in the Anbar corridor and operations to retake Mosul would be uh, consecutive or simultaneous? Yeah. Uh, so, the no, we probably will not finish uh, before the the secretary's uh, meeting. But 
you know, it's it's an iterative process, right? It's continuous back and forth. Uh, so, um, but, you know, we're always talking from here. We're always talking with Washington, uh, and we're able to give them a sense for specifically, you know, what direction they should push and where they should go. On um, on simultaneous or sequential operations, you know that. <sighs> A lot of that is what the Iraqi army will decide, you know. Um, we've given them advice on how we believe that ought to go. Uh, I think we need to keep that one private because we sort of want to protect some of that information. I think the enemy's probably paying good attention to, to our intent. So we want to keep some of that to ourselves. Uh, understand this, I think. The most important thing is that our fundamental concept is to pr place simultaneous pressure on this enemy across the entire battlefield, the depth and the breadth of this battlefield. So that's our going in principle, right? Keep pressure on this enemy all the time, everywhere, because that forces them to have to make very difficult decisions. Uh, so I'm not going to specifically talk about whether or not it's going to be a sequential or a, or a simultaneous operation uh, to take Mosul and, and to, to pressure the Anbar corridor, but what I'll tell you is our fundamental uh, uh, um, technique is this operationalization of the battlefield. So keep pressure uh, across everything all the time. Uh, Christina. Hi, Steve. It's Christina. Um, back on the 10 brigades uh, for the Mosul offensive, um, I think last week you said two would be Peshmerga. Uh, would the rest be regular ISF? What would the rest look like? And, and how many of them uh, received some training and how many of them would you know, are not trained. Uh, how many Sunni tribal forces would be needed, and how many police? And how long does it take to get a brigade trained um, from scratch? So it takes eight weeks to get a brigade trained from scratch. The disposition of forces on the battlefield, so how many police, how many Pesh, how many CTS, how many everything. These are all part of the plan that's in development by the government of Iraq. So the answer to your question doesn't exist yet. The government of Iraq is continuing the, the planning process, uh, you know, analyzing the battlefield, analyzing the enemy situation, taking into account the expected degradation of the enemy based on our air strikes, etc. Taking into account the advice that we give them based on the pressure that we're able to place on the enemy in Syria. Right? So all these factors have to come into play uh, as the Iraqis kind of develop their scheme of maneuver on the ground. So there isn't an answer to your question yet. It's part of the plan. Estimated 10 so far. I, I, I think you did say two would be Peshmerga, right? So then with the rest, what, what's the rest envisioned to be? Yeah, so the the rest will be, you know, determined by uh, the uh, Iraqi government's decision process, right? So they haven't they haven't decided that yet. Uh, they're working with us. We're advising them. We're giving them some some I think good advice, uh, but but they haven't been able to determine it because they've got other factors that they have to worry about as well, uh, you know. Uh, so I think the the prime minister. Uh, of Iraq, along with the Chief of Defense, the Minister of Defense, and they're weighing all of the different uh, factors that they have to weigh as, you know, the elected uh, and appointed leadership of the country. So, you know, we just don't have a number for you. Yeah, yeah, Steve, you just mentioned the degradation of the enemy may, may be one factor in how many troops in Mosul. Is there a new estimate for how many ISIS are in Iraq and or Syria right now? Has the, have the numbers changed? Uh, you know, I think they have, but I don't have the most updated numbers. I just didn't check on that one, uh, Courtney. So the, the last set of numbers, you know, we know are 19 to 30,000. Uh, it's my understanding that those numbers have begun to, that there's a new uh, consolidated intelligence community estimate, but I don't have those numbers for you. But we'll, we'll research it and get it back to you. A couple of different questions, Colonel Warren. Um, on the 10 brigades, can I just clarify with you? I think previously 
uh, you and others had mentioned eight brigades. So is the 10 just now, including Pesh and police, or has the top line number of brigades gone up? Uh, you know, it's, a, it's an approximate number, right? So uh, it hasn't gone up. Uh, you know, it, it kind of continues to evolve over time. Uh, so you're right. It, we had a different number before, and we had a different number today, and there'll be a different number next week. So I, I really have to caution everyone uh, that it is we are s too early to really start putting numbers out uh, because the numbers haven't been determined. And next week, as we continue analysis, it may change again. Uh, so we're we're trying to, you know, develop uh, what we believe will be a uh, workable and and resourceable and effective plan in conjunction with the Iraqis. Uh, so we're going to continue to iterate this. We're going to continue to chip away at this uh, until something finally comes together. But we're we're simply not there yet. It's just you know this is still January. Uh, you know this is this is going to be many months. Uh, before we see actual operations uh, for for Mosul begin, so right now our focus is let's start training some brigades, let's start building some combat power, let's continue to train some police and start building up some combat power while we simultaneously continue to iterate this plan and continue to iterate the scheme of maneuver, and while we simultaneously continue to degrade uh, the enemy. So this is going to this is going to change. It's going to evolve. Uh, nobody's ready to really slap the table yet and just, and say, okay, this is this is it. Uh, we're moving out. It's it's simply too soon for that. For uh, follow up questions, if I may, then um, on Raqqa, um, can you just illuminate a little bit more about what you are doing uh, to to uh, on strike on missions in Raqqa? what you're doing and what the effect has been that you believe uh, is on ISIS in Raqqa. Do you think that uh, secretary, the secretary's talked about getting ISIS out of Raqqa, you know, maybe even this year. How, how feasible is it to really challenge ISIS in Raqqa given what is, what is happening there? And then, so just illuminate Raqqa a little bit more. And my other question is, I wasn't sure I understood on the B1s. Um, so my apologies. Are you now saying that the B1s either have left CENTCOM, are leaving CENTCOM? Is it a standard rotation? Will that capability even be replaced? So on Raqqa, um, uh, our focus on Raqqa really is to, uh, to isolate through fires. So we are delivering precision fires. Uh, in two ways. One, against some of their high value targets. Two, uh, against some of the lines of communication or the supply lines, also known as roads, uh, that come and go out of Raqqa. So find a bridge, uh, you know, find a road junction, something like that, and, and strike it to degrade it. So that's what we're doing right now is isolating uh, Raqqa. Uh, additionally, what you'll see or what, you, what you've seen is maneuver of friendly forces in the vicinity of Raqqa. One great example of that is the Tishreen Dam. Another great example of that is uh, Al Hall. So the Tishreen Dam to the west, Al Hall to the east. And as this enemy sees forces maneuver, the enemy has to then try to predict what's going to happen next and act accordingly. And by doing that, he exposes himself uh, to our airstrikes. So that's kind of the, the sequence of events there in Raqqa. So it's a, it's a process right now of isolation and degradation. So we've, we're trying to isolate them to make their lives harder, to make it more difficult for them to move things in and out of the city. Uh, and, and we're trying to degrade them, chip away at their, at their, at their strength and their combat power there. Uh, it is certainly feasible uh, that Raqqa uh, can be pressured or, or, or even assaulted uh, in, in the next year. It's also feasible that it will take more than one year. Uh, so we, you know, the enemy does get a vote, uh, and and we have to see how rapidly we can develop uh, some of these uh, partner forces, some of these moderate Syrian opposition forces that are in Syria. Obviously, we don't have the types of relationships there in Syria as we do 
uh, here in Iraq. You know, in Iraq, we have a standing army with an established chain of command, with training programs, etc. Uh, so we're able to, you know, apply pressure a little bit more rapidly. In in Syria, it's not quite as it's not quite as solid. On the B1s, standard rotation, we haven't made. Uh, I haven't made an announcement. I don't know, FSET may have. Uh, but right, so it's just a standard rotation. We don't expect that we're going to lose any capability whatsoever. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, carrier groups come in. Uh, and we're going to see other aircraft come in in the near future. Uh, you know, as we've seen other uh, other platforms rotate out of uh, rotate Turkey out. and other places. That's just part of the, that's part of the rotation. Also, you know, the 82nd Airborne Division uh, will be rotating out here okay. in the coming weeks. Uh, but they'll be replaced by the 101st uh, mm -hmm. Division. So this is just how we have to do combat here. Because we don't know when this operation will complete, we set all of our forces on a rotation schedule. So they come in, they operate for a while, and then they're, then they're relieved with fresh troops. I don't think you heard that. So oh. They asked if you were going to rotate out. <laughs> 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 yeah, I wish I knew. Jeff, tell me when I'm coming home. All right. Um, next, uh, calling on Kim Dozier. So, uh, along the lines of um, a couple of questions that have been asked about looking ahead to combat in Mosul. Do you have a new estimate on what combat has left behind inside Ramadi in terms of the last we heard was 80% of the city was destroyed, but that was when coalition forces, Iraqi forces, had about 80% of the city um, under their control. So do you have a new estimate? Uh, is electricity back on? Is water back on? Are you aware of how fast services are being restored to the population and how fast the population is returning? Right. No, fair, good question. So first off, a lot of that is, is really uh, underneath uh, some of the, the humanitarian organizations. Uh, but what we, here's what we do know. We do know that uh, Governor Huawei has a, a, a solid plan uh, for, for first uh, stabilizing. All right. So there's a two-phase operation, stabilization uh, followed by reconstruction. So um, we're working now. The Iraqis are working now to get some generators in place. Uh, we believe that Al Tamim will have water uh, functioning here within the next, you know, coming weeks. I think is probably about right. Uh, the electricity is not really going too well yet, uh, but we are working to get some generators moved in. And again, when I say we, in this case, it's the global coalition. It, U.S. military coalition military doesn't really have anything to do with that. Uh, uh, so. No solid estimates on times for when electricity will be up, when water will be up, but we're seeing in bits and pieces uh, a slow, steady, uh, and hopeful return to normalcy. Uh, generators beginning to move. The apparently the water infrastructure in the Tamim area was not too badly damaged, uh, so it only needs some fairly low-level repairs to get that up and running. Much more damage in other parts of the city, so it will take longer. Uh, there have not been to my knowledge, much in the way of uh, uh, returns yet. Uh, it's a little too early for that. The enemy has generally been pushed out, uh, but the clearing or the reducing of the obstacles, the booby traps, the landmines, that process is ongoing. And it's going to be a, a slow process. And while we say we have pushed the enemy out, uh, there's always the possibility that a sniper can infiltrate back in that a suicide vest, uh, you know, a, a, a fighter wearing a suicide vest can infiltrate back in. So this enemy is kind of harassing uh, the army as they try to clear these obstacles. And the reason that their enemy is, do is conducting these harassing operations is because they want the army, uh, they want to slow the army's ability to clear these obstacles, uh, you, know, to, you know, to keep them tied up in Ramadi longer. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question mostly. Just the follow, is there a new estimate on the amount of the city that's been destroyed? Is it, is it 85 or 90 percent now that you have 
and 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 is is the area of uh, ISIL control now down to five or ten percent, or are they totally into the hills around Ramadi? Right. Yeah. So uh, estimate of damages. So the UN hasn't come in and performed a formal estimate yet. The only estimate that we have is is kind of what we've done based on. Um, overhead imagery, right? So it's different, you know, from overhead imagery can't tell you whether or not the water's working. Overhead imagery can't tell you whether or not the sewer system's working. Overhead imagery can't tell you whether or not the electricity's working. But that's what we have. So based on that overhead imagery, it does appear that about 80% of the city has been damaged in some way, shape, or form. Uh, but that's all we know. That is that, that is a, almost in, in uh, a really not useful number Again, because we don't really have a sense of what the services are, and that's really important when you try to estimate a percentage of damage. That said, as the security situation stabilizes, uh, we're hopeful that soon uh, the UN's uh, uh, um, um, humanitarian folks can get in there and do a legitimate, real, no kidding estimate of the amount of damage that's been done uh, and, and what it's going to take to get it back up and running. Um, Oh, ISIL, right. Where are they? So they're, they're, they've been, and we can pull up the, I don't know if you guys can pull up the, the Ramadi map again. So they're out of Ramadi. The enemy's been pushed out of the Ramadi city center area. And I'm looking at the map here. Uh, uh, and where we see some enemy, of course, is up in the upper left, so the, the northwestern uh, uh, outskirts, maybe the exurbs of Ramadi, if you will, and the same thing to the upper right. Uh, uh, the northeastern section. So those are kind of outside of Ramadi, uh, but it is kind of, the, they are kind of support zones for this enemy uh, where, and allows them to occasionally infiltrate, like I said, a, a single sniper, a two-man sniper team, or perhaps a suicide vest uh, in, in an effort to harass and, and, and slow down uh, the progress that the Iraqi army is trying to make in, in stabilization and, and reducing the obstacles. Hi, Colonel Warren. Uh, quick different question. Um, there may be an appetite to send more forces from here, from the U.S., to Iraq uh, and maybe some other uh, assets from other nations and that sort of thing. We always hear about the kind of logistical challenges you guys have, capacity, no helicopters to get around, there's billeting issues and stuff. What kind of a challenge would adding more forces pose to you guys and how, how uh, fast could you respond to accommodate more troops? Yeah, so it, the answer is it depends, right? So the logistical, you have to look, think of logistical infrastructure, I guess we'll use the same analogy again as, as a pipe, right? Uh, that The logistical infrastructure is the, is the diameter of the pipe and uh, the number of forces that that pipe can support, right? So at some point, so we're not at max yet, uh, so, given that the existing infrastructure could support some number of more troops, I don't know the number, it's not a huge number, but it could support some additional troops. Uh, but then at some point you do have to expand the size of the pipe. Uh, so, you know, these are, these are matters that the logisticians spend a lot of time worrying about. Um, I don't have the numbers with me. Uh, but, you know, if we needed to ramp up the, the size of the logistical footprint, and if the government of Iraq agreed to it, uh, we can certainly do it relatively rapidly. No nation on earth uh, has the logistical capability uh, that that the American Army has. Frankly, you know, we like to say that um, you know amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics, uh, and and logistics is 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 really one of the American military's strongest suits. So if if needed, uh, we'll be able to expand logistical infrastructure. Uh, but right now, we've got enough logistical infrastructure to support what we have, plus a little bit more. Quick, put a finer point on it, like, let's just say add a thousand troops, could you, you do it with the existing pipe? Yeah, I, I have no idea, Gordon. You, we'd, have to, we'd have to go ask the J4 about that. Louis. Uh, Steve. Um, Steve, a question about um, Operation Tidal Wave. You haven't given an update on that in a while. 
Um, has that operation ceased? Um, or are there other, you know, has it evolved? And also, what is the situation with, I think you call them the Syrian Democratic Forces in the east? Have they made any um, territorial gains recently? Yeah. So Operation Tidal Wave 2 continues. In fact, we recently had uh, three or four airstrikes against uh, uh, gas and oil separation points uh, north of Deir Zor, so kind of in that region in between Deir Zor and, and Raqqa. Uh, I haven't gotten any new statistics yet on number of oil barrels reduced or things like that. Uh, uh, those, we, those, those stats kind of come out, you know, infrequently, and when they do, I'll, I'll certainly put them out to everyone. Uh, but Operation Tidal Wave 2 continues, uh, yeah, as does as do our other operations to to strike at other elements of ISIL's financial system. Um, the most notable, of course, have been our, our strikes against uh, banks, where we you know destroyed these piles of, of dash cash. Uh, uh, operations in the east, so. Uh, the Syrian Arab Coalition, we call it the SAC, had, had been operating along uh, the eastern uh, sector there of Syria. They've seized Al Hall, uh, cleared several hundred uh, square kilometers of territory. Uh, they have not yet uh, seized Shaddadi, uh, but you know, they've gone through several weeks of fairly tough fighting uh, and are kind of in a reset process now. Can I follow up? And what do you mean by the reset process? I mean, is that because they're realigning uh, their forces, or what, what have they found tougher than expected opposition inside? No, I mean, they made significant progress there. They, you know, they made a lot of progress in a short period of time. Troops have to rest, right? And they're unfortunately for them, they're not like us, right? They can't rotate back to the states. You know, they live there. So after a significant and tough fight. Um, you know, they need to be resupplied, they need to fix their weapons that have been broken, they need fresh boots, uh, they need to do all the things that an army or a, a fighting force needs to do to bring itself back up to full strength to resume offensive operations. Uh, Colonel Warren, how many more U.S. forces are needed to train the Iraqi military? Lucas, we don't have a number yet. Uh, this is we're in a process of, of determining what that number is going to be, uh, and that and that process involves discussions uh, with the Iraqis to to find out uh, how what they want, and it involves discussions, uh, you know, amongst ourselves to determine what we think is necessary. So as that number uh, uh, is developed, we'll we'll try to to get it out to you. Uh, but right now, there simply is no number in eastern Syria and the Deir Zor area? Lucas, can you ask that again? The, you got clipped there. The, the first half got clipped. Reports of ISIS gaining territory in eastern Syria? Yeah, they... So in, in the city of Deir Zor, ISIL... Um, is battling regime forces. Uh, they recently, using the cover of a sandstorm, uh, had success in a single neighborhood. They seized. They, Deir Zor right now is split about 50 percent uh, controlled by uh, ISIL, about 50 percent controlled by regime forces. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, ISIL was able to make some gains in the city of Deir Zor, uh, bumping them from 50 percent to maybe 56 percent. Uh, um, the regime gained some of it back uh, when the weather cleared and they were able to bring uh, some air power to bear. Uh, but that's about it. So nothing significant, not really a major tactical event, really small localized, you know, tactical events. Can you talk about the impact Russian airstrikes are having in northwest Syria? Uh, it appears the regime is gaining ground against the Syrian opposition. Has the Russian airstrikes tipped the balance in the regime's favor overall in northwest Syria and overall in the conflict? Yeah, the Russian airstrikes have made a difference uh, for the regime. The Russian airstrikes have uh, helped uh, strengthen Bashar al-Assad. Uh, particularly in, in the Aleppo region, 
uh, where Russian airstrikes have been probably most intense. And those Russian airstrikes uh, have benefited uh, the Assad regime and have allowed the Assad regime to push back uh, both uh, moderate Syrian opposition forces and, in some cases, uh, ISIL. So everybody's in Aleppo. There's ISIL there. There's regime forces there. There's moderate opposition forces there. And over the past you know, several months, uh, Russian strikes have benefited the regime uh, and hurt both ISIL and the moderate Syrian opposition forces. And uh, lastly, here to Bill. Uh, thanks, Colonel Warren. <clears throat> First, on the ETF, um, we know that that is in place. Uh, uh, Secretary Carter said that a couple weeks ago. Have they become operational yet? Have they started doing any operations? I know you're not going to be able to discuss everything they do, but can we say they're operational? And then uh, secondly, on YPG, um, are they staying uh, west of the Euphrates? I know that, that was a red line for the Turks. Thanks. On the ETF, I can confirm that Secretary of Defense Carter did announce that they were, they were uh, present here. Uh, we're not going to discuss uh, anything else about their operations. One of the things that gives these types of forces their security is secrecy, right? Secrecy is security for them. Uh, so we will, I will only confirm uh, that the Secretary of Defense did announce their presence in Iraq. On the YPG uh, uh, and the Euphrates River, uh, the YPG has not crossed the Euphrates River, uh, with one exception, and that's in and around the Tishreen Dam. Uh, and it's really the Syrian Arab Coalition, or, or Syrian, it's not the SAC that we know from the east, but it's, it's other Syrian Arabs. Uh, who are operating in and around the Tishreen Dam I have secured uh, a, a couple of pieces of high ground west of the Tishreen Dam uh, to prevent the enemy from being able to bring indirect fires on the dam. Uh, and that was, that was worked out ahead of time, and, and so everyone's satisfied with it. All right. Well, thank you, Steve, for your time, to, time this morning, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Okay, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.